Well, good morning, Ecclesia. It's great to be with you on finally a decent weather day in this godforsaken heat-riddled city. <laughs> if we haven't met yet, my name is Sean. I am honored to serve as teaching pastor here in our campus on the west side, and uh, we're glad to have you with us. And uh, we're going to spend a few minutes um, in the scriptures this morning. And as we begin that time, let me ask God's blessing. Creator God, we are so grateful that you love us and that you have accepted us as your daughters and your sons. And we ask, Lord, that you continue to walk with us, Lord. And we trust that you have been when we see it, when we know it, when it seems distant and far. And we realize, God, that we arrive here this morning with so many different experiences from you but trusting, Lord, and needing for you to speak to us in ways that we can see and know and understand. And toward that end, God, I pray that you pour through me the gift of teaching. That everything said here be from you and because of you and guiding us towards you, Lord, as we partner with you to bring about your preferred future for all of creation. And we ask it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So you picked a good weekend to be here if you are new to our community because we are launching a new series that we're going to be in for six weeks that uh, we don't typically like brand our series like we just say like what the topic is or what the text is, but uh, we wanted to call this one Surprising Hope because we're going to spend the next six weeks talking about the Beatitudes. And I just want to warn you uh, because... Today is going to be a little bit different than what you've come to expect. Uh, Our teaching time is going to be a little bit more didactic, uh, more expository. Um, If you are like a preaching nerd, this is going to be a little bit more um, deductive than inductive which is what we typically do in terms of our teaching at Ecclesia. And now I am realizing that in this room, I am the only preaching nerd. (laughs) So here in our community, we are getting better and better at telegraphing and knowing what it is that we're going to teach on the weekends. Uh, And so One of the realities is that over the six plus years that I've been here, like sometimes we were like week to week. But now, if you were to ask me or someone on our staff, somewhere in the universe lives a spreadsheet. And I can tell you from what we're going to teach on the weekends from now until May 26th of next year. It turns out, though, that some of you have figured that out. And so in the middle of one series... You will ask me or maybe Pastor Chris, like, what's next on the series? What's the next series? Which is an okay question. It hurts when you ask about what's next. Like, we're in the middle of one right now, and it's like, how long, oh Lord, will I have to endure this? And so if people have asked recently, as we were in our series on work for the last six weeks, what was coming next, um, we have told them the Beatitudes. And what I find interesting about that, and when I say interesting, what I actually mean is shocking, is that many of you have looked at us when we said that with a question on your face that said, what are the Beatitudes? And I get that many of us aren't like me. Like I grew up in church, like I was in the pew, like the first week that I was born. I've always been around this. And some of you um, have come to faith later. Some of you are just exploring it. Some of you are here because someone you want to date or someone you're a friend with dragged you here and they promised you lunch or brunch or something like that. So I get it. The world is really different. The Beatitudes are in Matthew. Because the rest of you who have been around a while should know that because the Beatitudes are in Matthew. It's the first book of the New Testament. And it's in the fifth chapter 
of the first book. You don't have to get that far. So now I know who was prepared for class as a student and who just showed up and wanted to look on their friend's paper. But I'm also cognizant of the fact that the world is really different than the world that I grew up in. And I grew up in a world, in a church really, that kind of assumed a Christian worldview. And that's no longer the case. Like even folks who had no intention of following Jesus with their lives knew what Jesus said. My friend Jason actually wrote a book about the Beatitudes. And early in the book, he tells a story of a dinner that he was having with a friend of his in Washington, D.C. several years ago. And, and this friend, their vocation, they work actually in the Middle East trying to heal some of the damage and relationships between Israelis and Palestinians. But they were joined by a third person at their dinner who was a friend of Jason's friend. And Jason, Jason was asked during the dinner to share with the third friend. And this third friend is a human rights attorney. And so his friend asked Jason if he could share a little bit about what Jesus might have to say about disturbances and violence and war and the history in the Middle East. And as soon as he asked, the human rights attorney jumped in and he says, no offense, but Jesus has nothing to do with this. And I don't know enough about the world and politics. I don't know enough to say much of anything about the events of the last week in Israel and some aspects of it to me are very clear and other aspects are exceedingly, exceedingly complicated. But what I do want to suggest to all of us is that Jesus does have something to say about it. Jesus has something to say, and Jesus has something to say about all the areas of my life and all the areas of your life, your romantic life, your work life, the way you raise your children. Jesus has something to say about the way you drive and about the way you speak. Jesus has something to say about the way you dress and the way you live. Jesus has something to say about all of it. And the Beatitudes are going to remind us of that. Because we are a people who will look to the top of every mountain and under every rock for wisdom. We will listen to podcasts and TED Talks. We will go to better help and social sciences and seminars and everywhere. And there's a lot of wisdom to be found in all of those places. But the only wisdom to be found in those places, it's only wisdom insofar as it harmonizes with the way that God made you and what Jesus says about how to live life. And here's what I want you to know. Like as we launch into this series together, that Jesus is not naive. Jesus isn't simplistic. He's not overly idealistic. When Jesus came, he taught people who were living under occupation. Women weren't much more than property Slavery existed, infanticide existed. Young women and young men, really, basically, boys and girls, were sold into prostitution regularly. Men had absolutely no expectation at all to be faithful to their spouses. Jesus comes into a complicated world, and it was no less complicated than your world. 
And I know there is a temptation in the 21st century to look around at our world and go, that was then, things are so much more complicated now, we are so sophisticated and smart now, we actually believe in the myth of progress? That the people who came before us were basically idiots, and like we've got that all figured out now. And that's the world that Jesus comes into. So into that world, what do you think Jesus might say? What would be most important? I think I can guess what most of us would think is most important, or at least what's the most important to us. What's most important to us are all the things that they have reality TV shows about. Like how to be thin, how to be rich, how to hook up with somebody attractive. And Jesus doesn't talk about any of that. When Jesus comes, he starts over and over talking about this thing that he calls the kingdom of God. And if you've been around churches, you've heard the language of the kingdom of God. You've heard people say that. And what many people hear, what many of us maybe hear, when we hear the language, the kingdom of God, is we think about heaven. And we think heaven and the kingdom of God is someplace that we go after we die. And that's not at all what Jesus means. When Jesus says kingdom, he means something completely different. And you know this already because you know what it is to have a kingdom because everybody, every person on the planet has their own kingdom. You don't think you do, but you do. And your kingdom is the place in your life where your will is done. So maybe you're like me. I have at my house a home office. And we bought this house because it had a home office. The furniture in it is what I want. The paint on the wall is the color that I want. Everything in that office is where I want it to be. And if my wife or children go in there and move something, I know it. And Rochelle and I bought this house together. We own it together. Well, actually, the bank owns most of it. <laughs> but that's my kingdom. And the reason I know this is because when she needs to do something in that space, she will come to me, even though we own the house together, and she will say, do you mind if I use your office? It's the place where my will is done. And everyone has a place like this. For some, it's a room in your house. Ladies, this is why so many husbands want a man cave. Because he knows the rest of the house is your kingdom. It can be as small as your purse or as large as the company that you run or the people that you oversee. It's where the things that you want done are done and everyone has a place where things are done the way that they are done because they want them done that way. And that's what it means to have a kingdom. And when Jesus comes, he says, God has a kingdom. And right now, today, you can live in that kingdom. This is how he talks about it in Luke 17. Luke says, Jesus comes and preaches, the kingdom of God comes, but not with signs that you can observe. People are not going to say, look, here it is. 
They're not gonna say, look, it's over there. You want to see the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is already here among you. Jesus says, there is a place that you can't see it, not everyone will find it, but it's here now. There is a place where God's rule and God's reign are present and it is not far off. It is not a way, you don't have to wait for it. You can live in it now. The present availability of the kingdom of God is the space that Jesus has created all of us for maximum human flourishing. Everything that Jesus teaches is about how to live in the kingdom of God. And everything Jesus does, all of those miracles, all of those healings are pictures of what it is to live in the kingdom of God. And so we turn to this piece of scripture, the Beatitudes, which apparently many of you don't even know is in the Bible. And Jesus begins to preach. And this is how Matthew captures that story. He says, now when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain as Moses had done before him. And he sat down as Jewish teachers of his day usually did. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. Blessed are the spiritually poor. And the better, the better translation of that is poor in spirit. That everyone experiences a time where they feel poor in spirit, but that is connected to an emotion and an experience because the spirit is actually not yours to control or have more or less of. The spirit is God's. So poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. Blessed are the meek and gentle. They will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. Blessed are the merciful. They will be shown mercy. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. They will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. And blessed are you. Blessed are you, all of you, when people persecute you or denigrate you or despise you or tell lies about you on my account. But when this happens, rejoice. Be glad. Remember that God's prophets have been persecuted in the past and know that in heaven you have a great reward. So those beatitudes, blessed, it's a Greek word, makarios. It just means to be blessed, to be well off. That Jesus is answering the question, who is really well off? In this world, who are the people who are well off? And I don't know about you, when I read that in Matthew 5, none of that sounds like a blessing. None of that sounds like somebody who is really well off. One of my favorite writers, a philosopher named Dallas Willard, talks about the Beatitudes this way. He says, the Beatitudes in particular are not teachings on how to be blessed. They're not instructions to do anything. They do not indicate conditions that are especially pleasing to God or good for human beings. No one is actually being told that they are better off for being poor, for mourning, for being persecuted and so on so that the conditions listed are recommended ways to well-being before God or man, nor are the Beatitudes indications of who will be on top after the revolution. They are explanations and illustrations 
drawn from the immediate setting of the present availability of the kingdom through personal relationship to Jesus. They single out cases that pro provide proof that in him the rule of God from the heavens truly is available in life circumstances that are beyond all human hope. And this is the surprising hope of the Beatitudes that you will both love and hate. And it is simply this. No one is unblessable. No one is unblessed. And this is a shock in our world because we believe that there are people, or at least there should be people, who are unblessable. We think people who don't work as hard as we think they ought to work should be unblessable. And we think folks who don't share our politics, our worldview, should be unblessable. We think the uneducated or the elites or the overweight or the wealthy or the poor or the foreigner or the racial or the sexual minority shouldn't be blessed. Like we all have someone who doesn't make the cut, someone who we think shouldn't be, or at least we wouldn't bless. And so imagine you're standing there and Jesus starts to teach and you're living under occupation or your property, you're a slave, you're persecuted for your beliefs. When every metric available to you tells you that you are unblessed. And Jesus says, you're blessed. And you are blessed because the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God is available to you right now, right here. And some of us walked in here today believing that we were unblessable. That we've screwed up too much, too many bad decisions. You think you fit all of the categories that our world calls a loser. You don't look like a model or you don't look like you used to look. You failed in your career or you failed at a relationship or multiple relationships. Someone betrayed you, someone hurt you, you're broke. You have tension with your parents or with your children. Maybe you feel like you are kind in a particular way that people just walk over you all of the time. You look at our world and you yearn for peace and an end to violence. Or maybe for some of us, someone that we deeply love has died. and you think you're unblessable. Or at the very least, unblessed. And Jesus says, you are blessable. You are blessed right here, right now. And the people and the situations that our world sees as helpless. are blessed because the kingdom is here and you can live in the rule and reign of God right now. And if our world isn't the fullness of the kingdom, do you know what your house can be? Your relationships can be the way you raise your children can be the way you practice your business, the way you speak to people can be the kingdom of God. When life looks and feels hopeless, 
The kingdom of God is near. I wanted to show you all my favorite new sweatshirt. And it is this one. So this summer, I broke the sabbatical rules and did some work. And it was because my sabbatical dates got changed and I'd already agreed to speak at this camp in Nashville, camp for high school students. And I noticed the first afternoon that I was there just walking around that there were a lot of kids um, who had autism diagnoses. And I don't know if you have friends or family members who have children who are somewhere on the autism spectrum, but when that happens, there can be an immense feeling of being alone and you don't know, like most of us think, we've got our children under our roof from now until they leave for college or enter their workforce, but all of those are questions. And so I was talking to the director of the camp and there were all these people walking around with t-shirts and sweatshirts with this design on them. I said, well, what's that about? And he explained to me that several years ago, they were at camp, and that year he brought his son with him to camp, and his son has autism. And it was late in one of the big sessions they have with everyone that his son came up on stage with him, and he asked his son a question and handed him the microphone. And he took the mic and he just yelled out, two wolves. That was it, like nothing prompted it. There was no question about wolves, just two wolves. And so they started this ministry called Best Buddies and they sell all of this gear with just two wolves on it. And for at least a week, every summer, interspersed with all of those children, all of those middle school kids and high school kids who don't have a diagnosis of autism are all of these kids who have over the years begun to come to that camp and they just get to be kids with everyone else because the kingdom of God is near. But 10 years ago, I was asked to guest teach a class at Baylor on writing for good. And there was a co-teacher with me for that day and we both lived in the same area at the time, so we rode together. And I didn't know who she was, I didn't know what kind of writing she did, like what kind of advocacy writing she did, and she explained to me that um, years before her daughter was born with Down syndrome. And so that had led her over time to having an Instagram page about it and writing about it and parenting kids with Downs. And also in that same time, they adopted another child with Down syndrome. And she told me, it's been the greatest blessing of my life. because the kingdom of God is near. Here's a simple reality of your life and of my life. In the worst moments, regardless of what anyone says about you, your story, your past, Jesus says, you are blessed. Right here, right now. Because in the kingdom of God, no one is beyond blessing. No one is unblessable. Now when I read the Beatitudes, I see something that I'd never seen before. Because you know who was poor in spirit? Do you know who mourned? 
who was described as meek, who hungered and thirsted for righteousness. Do you know who was merciful, who was pure in heart, who was a peacemaker, and who was persecuted? Do you know who that is? That's not just you. That's Jesus. And the invitation for you right now is to live inside that blessing, inside the kingdom of God. Ecclesia, let me pray for you. God, thank you for being with us in what we might define as the worst circumstances and conditions, that you have blessed us and continue to bless us and walk with us even when we feel lost and abandoned. And we ask, Lord, that you give us a deeper sense of that space that you have created within us and within our world to live in the kingdom of God where your rule and your reign are done. And we ask it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.